Have you ever found yourself in a situation where you can't exactly buy a new game, but you still want to try one out? We've all been there before, and thanks to video game rental services, we've been able to try out games before buying them. But how would you know what games are worth your rental time or not? Well, that's what I'm here for today. I'm Unreal, and I ain't got games. This series is mainly for the people who prefer renting their games rather than buying them, whether it be for budget reasons or some other reasons they may have. Now you may be asking, if this is about reviewing video game rentals, why is this series called Ain't Got Games? Well, that's pretty simple. Do you see this shelf full of games? For this series, let's just pretend that this shelf doesn't exist. In fact, let's pretend that these games don't even exist. I'm limiting myself to only the games I'm renting for this particular series, just so I could put myself in the shoes of someone in this position. That doesn't mean I'll never review what's on this shelf, but those will just be regular reviews instead. And one last thing, I'm not trying to convince people to buy games here, only whether a game rental is time well spent or just time wasted. Everyone got the point of the series now? I hope so, because this will be the only time I'm going to explain it. Now with that taken care of, let's talk about a certain little series known as Resident Evil. I'm going to be blunt about this. I love the Resident Evil series. After my very first experience with the GameCube remake when it first came out, I've been a fan of the series ever since. Whether it be the horror aspect, the gameplay, or the characters, I enjoyed every bit of it while being scared shitless. Ever since then, I have played a good number of the games in the series, some of which I've beaten, and some of which I can't really complete at this point in time. Aside from the main installments, there were a number of spin-off titles for the series, including, but not limited to, Resident Evil Gaiden, The Umbrella and Dark Side Chronicles, or others such as Survivor and Dead Aim. I bring up the subject of spin-offs as this particular Resident Evil game I'm going to cover is a spin-off as well. Enter Resident Evil Operation Raccoon City. Resident Evil. When this game was first announced, I almost had no hope for it. From what I saw at the time, all I saw was just a generic third-person shooter that barely played or resembled anything like a Resident Evil game. So at the time I just ignored it since I was looking more forward to Revelations on the 3DS. But by the time this game actually came out, I just said, fuck it, and decided to give it a rent, thinking that I may actually like it. So, let's give it a go. The whole concept behind Operation Raccoon City is that it's a big what-if scenario of the events that took place in Resident Evil 2 and 3. Instead of being in the shoes of the main characters from those games, you instead follow an umbrella security service team known as Wolfpack. If you are even remotely familiar with the series, you can already tell that these characters never existed in the main storyline of Resident Evil. In fact, this entire concept almost sounds like a fanfiction writing turned into a full-priced game, which it basically is. So yeah, this installment is non-canon to the main story, kind of like how Gaiden wasn't canon to the main story as well. But at the same time, I'm actually liking this idea. I mean, putting a new twist on an old Resident Evil game can be really cool if done right. By the way, I forgot to ask, who developed this game? Hmm, never heard of them. What other games did they make before this? They made that game. Hmm. This is gonna suck, isn't it? Anyways, the whole game starts off inside the Raccoon City Underground Laboratory where Wolfpack is basically sent in to assist Hunk and his team in stopping William Birkin. And so, the game begins and immediately shows off, as I stated earlier, that this is a third person shooter set in the Resident Evil universe, and not a traditional Resident Evil game. Now, I want to make this clear. I'm going to try my best and not compare this to previous Resident Evil games in the series, because this game is not trying to be like those. But at the same time, I absolutely hate how this game decided to be a generic third person shooter in the style of SOCOM. I mean, I know installments like Resident Evil 5 are more action oriented, but this one just doesn't feel right. 
So for the sake of this review, I'm just going to grade this game based on its own merits instead of comparing it to previous installments. Now, as soon as the first enemies appeared in the room, I already encountered an issue with this game. The aiming. The aiming isn't terrible by any means, but something feels off about it. It's almost like the aiming is both floaty and precise at the same time, while failing to find a balance between the two. The aiming is even worse when using sniper rifles, as trying to accurately hit targets is very difficult due to how damn sensitive the aiming is when using them. Then there's this weird pistol mode mechanic, where you hold down L2 to take out your sidearm, giving you the ability to shoot your pistol like in a twin stick shooter such as Geometry Wars or Dead Nation. It's kind of an impractical feature as you can just switch to your sidearm by tapping L2, and moving around while aiming in the mode makes your character look like he or she is doing the tango. Even worse, this feature can get in the way sometimes, as you can accidentally enter the mode when you just want to normally switch your weapon, which can be really disorienting after your aim swings you around randomly. But this level also introduces our first enemies in the game, the Spec Ops Soldiers. I do have some things to say about them, but let's save all of that for later. So after fighting through some of these soldiers, Hunk gives us a demonstration of melee combat. Don't forget your training. Um, what the hell just happened? <laughs> yep, not even five minutes into the game and we already encounter our first glitch. Amazing. In case you're confused, this is what's supposed to happen. Oh, don't worry, there's more glitches where that came from, but again, more on that stuff later. Eventually, you make your way to Birkin's lab, then Hunk and his team kill Birkin just like in Resident Evil 2. You, come with me. There he is. So, you finally come. Doctor. We're here to collect the G-Virus sample. Now, I wanted to show this part in particular just to show how scripted most of this game can be. That door straight ahead explodes after a few seconds, knocking everyone on their asses. However, watch where I stand before the door explodes. You see? I was nowhere near the door or explosion and I still got knocked on my ass. Those Spec Ops must be using some really powerful explosives to cause knockback like that. Anyways, Birkin comes back as a mutant after injecting himself with the G-Virus and chases down Hunk and Wolfpack. Most of this surmounts to shooting the giant eye on his arm and running away from him, as killing him is impossible because- <laughs> However, one particular moment involves Birkin pinning down the player who ends up triggering his Kool-Aid Man entrance, which engages said player in one of the only quick time events in this game. Well... Kinda. You see, when you're grabbed by an enemy like a zombie or liquor, you have to wiggle the left analog stick to get out of the grasp. The Birkin Quick Time event in particular involves pushing a certain direction two or three times in order to get up and escape. However, these prompts happen so fast that you'll most likely hit the wrong direction each time and end up dying instead. But like I said, this is the only point in the game where this different Quick Time event shows up. After retreating, Hunk tells Wolfpack to go without him as he has to go back and get the virus sample. What the hell are you doing? I lost the sample. I'm going back for it. And with that, the first mission is complete and... Wait a minute. Is that an experience bar? Right. I guess I should explain how leveling up in this game works. After each mission, you are given a grade on your performance based on number of kills, deaths, collectibles attained, and time taken on the level. The grades range from D to S+, but they don't exactly matter unless you're going for the achievement related to getting the S+, ranks. And after each mission, you can also earn experience points to level up your profile. You can even earn extra XP during missions by shooting cameras around the level, finding collectibles, or finding laptops, which also unlocks concept art in the gallery section. But unlike most shooters nowadays with an XP system, the XP is used a bit differently. Instead of leveling up to unlock new weapons and abilities, the total amount of XP you earn instead works as currency, where you can buy whatever weapons or character abilities you want. Of course, each gun costs different amounts of XP, but you are given a choice as to what you want to buy instead of having a fixed unlock system. 
This system, I'll admit, is a good change of pace for something as overused as a leveling up system in a shooter. Because, honestly, how many games nowadays has a leveling up system in them? Too many! As I stated earlier, there are six characters you can choose from in this game, each of which have different roles and abilities for the player to use. All characters have different passive and active abilities to fit their roles. Passive abilities are abilities that are permanent and help out each character differently, while active abilities are more suited for combat, but only one of the three available active abilities can be used on a mission. Active abilities also have a cooldown time between reuse and game, with the selected ability taking a short or long amount of time to recharge depending on the ability. Both of these types of abilities must be bought with XP first, and can be upgraded with XP as well to improve their overall effects. So let's go over the entire Wolfpack team gameplay-wise while we're at it. Lupo, the team leader, who I decided to call Lupo Fiasco from now on for some dumb reason, has abilities like Guns Ablazing, which regenerates ammo and increases bullet damage for a few seconds, and others such as Incendiary Ammo, which sets the gun on fire? Hang on a second. How does that work? I mean... I thought the method of getting fire bullets in the recent Alone in the Dark game was dumb, but having the gun set on fire to shoot fire bullets? I mean, wouldn't that melt the gun or burn Lupo's hands or, or something? Kinda makes you wonder how Umbrella tested this shit in their labs. Alright, fire bullet testing number one. All you have to do is press the button on the side of the gun and that should activate your fire bullets. Button? Oh, this must be it. Hope this works. OH GOD IT'S HOT! OH GOD! Ah! Vector is the recon of the team, and he is more specialized in stealth, given that one of his active abilities is a cloak, which is one of the most useful abilities in the game. Beltway is the demolitions expert and can throw timed explosives or plant trip mines, while benefit from having more resistance against explosives. Spectre's role is surveillance, and his abilities include being able to find enemies and items on the minimap, and having things like thermal and sonar vision. Four Eyes is a field scientist, which gives her the ability to have an infected enemy such as a zombie or hunter fight other enemies, which can be entertaining for a few minutes, but is impractical for most of the game. Then there's Bertha, the medic. She has the ability to hold more than one first aid spray, since players are only allowed to carry one first aid spray at a time, and also has better healing bonuses, which actually makes her a useful part of the team. And while we're on the subject, let's talk about the characters themselves. Personality-wise, there really isn't anything special about these Umbrella operatives. In fact, they just feel generic as all hell, despite having unique attitudes and personalities from each other. I will give Slant 6 some credit, though. I do generally like the character designs of the Wolfpack team, except for maybe Spectre's goggles, since those goggles look really fucking goofy. I mean, who the hell would wear goggles that stick out that far from the wearer's face? What? Before moving on to the second mission, I need to point something out first. There are only seven missions in the entire game. SEVEN MISSIONS! The thing is, each mission lasts about 30 minutes or so, which means as a whole, the single player in this game lasts a mere... Two hours. So yeah, this is a really short game. But considering how short most games are nowadays, I'm not even remotely surprised. Starting with the second mission, you are tasked with finding evidence of Umbrella's involvement with the Raccoon City outbreak and destroying it, which makes sense considering Umbrella doesn't want to be blamed for being responsible. It is at this point where you encounter zombies for the first time in the game. And yes, even if you try to dodge the zombie breaking the door, you are scripted to being grabbed by the zombie and thrown into the room. <laughs> Shortly after, you end up meeting Nikolai from Resident Evil 3. And yep, he sure is Nikolai. And why are you here? My team was sent here to rescue citizens, but there's no time for that. City Hall is a mess. I'm trying to find a safe zone. Oh, running scared already? What I mean is that he's just the same evil bastard from Resident Evil 3, so there really isn't much to say about him right now. Since this level has a large amount of zombies, one method of taking them out is by meleeing them to death. Oh yeah, melee combat. I almost forgot about that aspect. Now to put it bluntly, melee combat is really unbalanced in this game. 
Pressing circle causes you to melee the enemy, and consistently hitting it will cause you to endlessly melee opponents. Doing this against groups of zombies is usually really effective and helps conserve ammo. When doing this against spec ops, it is possible to stun lock an enemy endlessly until he dies. However, the spec ops can do this to you as well, if you get too close to them. And sometimes they will never stop, giving you absolutely no chance to fight back, basically infinite comboing you until you die. One other feature is that you can melee in any direction you want, even behind you, which causes the player to do back kicks and jump punches. Doing this endlessly makes it look like they're dancing instead of fighting. I mean really, just imagine these umbrella operatives doing a choreographed dance number. There is more to melee combat than just spamming the circle button. Remember what Hunk did in the first mission? No, not that one! This one! What he showed off was a brutal melee kill, and there are two types of these kills. The first one is a standard one-hit kill by hitting circle then X, which has a total of two animations. And then there is the character-specific brutal melee kill, which is done by hitting circle then triangle. These can vary from spin attacking the enemy followed by a random flashbang, to killing an enemy and disguising as them. However, doing the character specific moves requires use of the active ability, meaning that the ability has to recharge after doing this kind of move. Then there is the option of taking zombies hostage by holding circle. Wait, what? Taking a zombie hostage? Seriously? Who the hell thought that was a good idea? I mean, what if they just bite you if you took them hostage and infect you if you tried something stupid like that? Either that, or Wolfpack just doesn't give two fucks about their own well-being. So yes, you can take zombies hostage and use them as bullet shields. And guess what? The zombies don't even try to bite you! It would have been more interesting gameplay-wise if taking a zombie hostage would cause you to lose bits of health from being bitten, but as a bonus it can give you extra protection from enemy fire. But nope! The zombies just do fuck all and take it like a bitch. Admittedly, doing this is actually kind of useful and fun against the spec ops. But at the same time, this mechanic can also cause serious griefing potential. You see, you can either snap the zombie's neck when holding it, or just kick it away. And guess what? You can kick them towards your teammates. And when you do that, 95% of the time the zombie will instantly grab your teammate. Nice job putting a griefable gameplay mechanic in your game, Slant 6. 5 stars, 8 plus, 4 stars! It's also possible to grab Spec Ops soldiers, but that just causes them to get on their knees and allows you to shoot them in the face. So there really is no point in doing it to them. That's basically the extent of melee combat in this game, but I'll explain the real issues with it later on in the review. Soon enough, you find out that Nikolai is, of course, a traitor, and after destroying most of the evidence of Umbrella's involvement, you meet back up with him, and he leaves you to fend off with an army of liquors. Remember how the liquors in Resident Evil 2 were both scary and dangerous to fight, especially early on in the game? Well, this game doesn't have those same threatening liquors. In fact, they're a fucking joke! The liquors in this game barely do any damage to you, and the only annoying thing that they can do is grab you with their tongue, which is really easy to break out of. In fact, you can even kick them endlessly until they die, and give them no chance to get back up. Gee, so much for being threatening enemies. So you finally break out of the liquor room and... Wait, where are my teammates? Are you serious? They're all dead? Now, that brings me both to the teammate and enemy AI in this game. They are the dumbest things ever! Words cannot describe how retarded your teammates are in this game. They love to block doorways when you're trying to get through, they tend to walk in front of you when you're trying to shoot, they can barely fight against certain enemies effectively, and they can't revive teammates. Meaning that most of the work is up to you and you alone. Even worse is when they can get stuck on the simplest of objects, or refuse to go with you during certain segments. The only notable thing I've seen my teammates do, specifically Bertha, is that she knows when to heal others, including the player. That's it. The enemy AI is just as bad. Now the zombies act like they should, I have no problems with them. 
but the Spec Ops soldiers are just plain dumb at times, whether it being where they don't shoot at you when you're near them, or how dumb their tactics are. The only real threatening thing about them is that their bullets do a good bit of damage. Note to developers. Having enemies hit harder does not equal better AI. But the worst part of all of this is that every enemy in this game is a goddamn bullet sponge. Again, the zombies make sense, as headshots are always the preferred method of taking a zombie down. But when it takes multiple clips to kill a single Spec Ops soldier or other BOWs, then there's a problem. Look at this, I shot three grenades directly at this soldier and he's still not dead. How is that even possible? It's like they all decided to channel Ark Thompson from Survivor when it came to taking damage like it's nothing. I got poisoned and hit nine times in a 16 second span, and after all that, I'm only in caution. So yeah, overall the AI is borderline retarded across the board, along with being unnecessary bullet sponges most of the time. The next mission requires Wolfpack to destroy the power plant to take out the city's electricity. However, Nikolai shoots the pilot of the chopper carrying the EMPs that are needed to take out the plant. And then he decides to... randomly blow shit up. Okay... Why didn't Nikolai blow up the street next to him for no reason? Mm. Must have been setting up for a montage or something. So while moving through the hospital, which is now on fire from the explosion, by the way, great spawn point for Beltway, it just set him on fire instantly, we have our first encounter with the Hunters. <sighs> hunters are the most annoying things in this game by far. They do a fair amount of damage to you, but they can also knock you on your ass after they jump attack you, which is really difficult to effectively dodge. Even worse is that this is their most common attack, so be prepared to get knocked down a lot. It doesn't help that the Hunters are the biggest bullet sponges in the game as well. So fighting them is a real pain in the ass, especially when going up against more than one. Anyways, after leaving the hospital, you make it to the crash site and find two of the three EMPs, and this is where Crimson Heads are mostly introduced. Now this is more of a nitpick, but why are Crimson Heads in this game? They were in the GameCube remake, but they weren't in any other installments outside of that, aside from the Wii Rail Shooters if you count those. But again, it's just a small nitpick I have, and it doesn't really affect how I feel about the game or anything. For those who don't know, Crimson Heads are faster and more powerful zombies, and are a bit harder to take out. Aside from being a more annoying version of the zombies to fight, that's all I have to say about them. Soon enough, you find out that Nikolai has the last EMP, so you engage in a boss fight with him. The fight is fairly straightforward, you just have to shoot him when he pops out, and fend off the zombies he summons by ringing the church bell. After you beat him, he runs off, but unfortunately you aren't allowed to go after him and kill him. Yeah, I wonder if this will come back to haunt me later in the game. So you get the last EMP, fight some more dumb spec ops, and finally make it to the power generator room. This part is not fun to play through at all. The goal is simple. You have to raise the three generators and set the EMPs on them. Problem is, doing this causes swarms of spec ops to appear. Since there are so many, they can easily drain your health down to nothing, making this room a complete pain in the ass to get through. Even Nikolai joins the fun by trying to snipe you as you do this, and getting hit by a shot knocks you down, making you open for being hit for a few seconds. And of course, your teammates are absolutely useless and end up getting killed each time. So have fun doing everything alone again. So after the EMPs are placed, all of the power in Raccoon City shuts down. Good. The power grid's down. Our job's done. No need to keep fighting. Leave those bastards in the dark. In the fourth mission, the team is tasked with fixing Nemesis by re-injecting a virus into him so Nemesis can go after the members of STARS. Yep. Injecting a virus into Nemesis so he can target the STARS members. I would talk about how incredibly dumb this additional detail is, but I actually have a similar virus right here. Now, I wasn't told what it does when it's injected, so let's try it out right now. <laughs> As you 
as usual, you just fight your way through zombies and spec ops and... Oh shit, I got infected. Fuck, what the hell am I supposed to do? Wait, I got cured? How? Anti-viral spray? Anti-viral spray? Are you telling me that this entire time there was a viable cure to the T-virus and it was just lying around the streets of Raccoon City? No! No! Does not compute! Seriously, this game just has cans of antiviral spray just so you can stop being infected? If that stuff was in the real games, then most of this outbreak wouldn't have happened! Sorry, I just... I need a moment. Just... Just keep going. But seriously, this game features antiviral spray to cure an infected player, just like how first aid spray works with healing. This would be useful, but there is actually an easier way to deal with infected teammates. By blowing their brains out. Yes, if a teammate is infected, you can kill them. The thing is, there is almost no penalty to this, as you can just be revived immediately after dying. Even if body parts are missing on you after dying, they just grow back like nothing happened when you get revived. So if you're infected and low on ammo, just have a teammate kill you. When you get revived, you'll start with half health, but you'll have the weapons you originally started out with complete with full ammo. So yeah, antiviral spray is fucking useless. There is one other game mechanic I forgot to mention earlier. Bleeding. You see, if you get attacked in succession, you have a chance to start bleeding. Bleeding doesn't cause you to get hurt more or have you consistently lose health, but instead, bleeding will attract any and all zombies towards you. This is usually bad as large swarms of zombies can wreck you and cause you to die, but if there are no zombies around, then it just does nothing. You can do the same thing to the Spec Ops soldiers as well, based on a gun stat known as Blood Frenzy. If a certain gun has higher Blood Frenzy, the higher chance it has to cause enemies to bleed. This can be helpful in terms of distracting Spec Ops, but it's only really helpful in one certain level in the entire game. As the level progresses, you finally make it to the- Wait a minute. Are those lights? Geez, so much for turning the power off in the entire city. Seems to me that Umbrella forgot the idea of backup generators! And this isn't the only place. There are other parts in the game and inside Raccoon City itself where it doesn't seem like the EMPs did anything to them. This game, man. Just... This game. When you enter the labs, you encounter yet another new enemy in the game. This... spider-like... creature thing. Oh gee, it takes over a zombie's head. I have never seen a monster do that kind of thing before- oh, No, wait, I actually did. It's called Half-Life! Yep, these new enemies are basically like head crabs. They can take over zombies and control them, or just attack you on their own. Aside from that, that's really all they do. They're just a minor annoyance, and don't really pose that much of a threat at times. And you know what's funny? I remember Slant 6 saying that they were going to add new types of B.O.W.s to the game, ones that we have never seen in the series before. Guess how many they added? One. Just. One. That's right. This headcrab is the only new B.O.W. in this game. That's it! Don't promise adding new B.O.W.s if you're only going to add one to the entire fucking game. And Crimson Heads do not count as new. Anyways, you get the virus from a dormant tyrant by using the biggest syringe ever, and proceed to go after Nemesis. However, Mr. X decides to make an appearance to hinder your progress. I'm guessing he's only here to be a mild annoyance to the group and to say, Hey, remember me from Resident Evil 2? Can I get my paycheck now? So you find Nemesis taking on a bunch of spec ops, and you are tasked with weakening him enough to inject the virus into him. This fight isn't hard, but it's kind of annoying as it takes a while for Nemesis to finally be weak enough to approach him. All you really have to do is shoot him enough until he falls to his knees. Then you can inject him with the- <laughs> What kind of animation was that? I mean, holy hell, what the fuck was that? That has to be the most awkward way to inject a syringe into someone, seriously. So with the virus injected, Nemesis now has his only purpose triggered again. Star. Oh, come on! That Nemesis voice barely sounds threatening at all. I mean, just listen to this. Stars. And compare it to this. Star. 
Which one sounds more scary and threatening? If you said the second one, you're an idiot. So all that's left now is to get rid of the last piece of evidence at the RPD building. After the evidence is destroyed, you just fight your way out of the building and get ready to be extracted from Raccoon City. That's the end of the game! Well, that was my review. Hope you guys enjoyed it. What is that? <sighs> yep, of course we're not done. How could I be so stupid? So at this point, Leon and Claire get separated just like at the start of Resident Evil 2, and because of this, Wolfpack doesn't get extracted and instead has to go investigate the crash site. Get up to the crash site and we get to see... Wait... What the hell is with Leon's face? Oh god... Oh god, Leon, what did they do to your face? It looks wrong! Now normally, getting too close makes Leon run off, but if you don't get too close, you can actually shoot at him! Doing so will cause him to fight back, and his bullets hurt. You're not supposed to do this as Leon is invincible, but doing this will make the cutscene that's supposed to trigger make no sense. Identify yourself! Oh, I don't know, Leon. Is that the first thing you ask people when they're shooting at you? Anyways, you lose track of Leon, Umbrella gets pissed, and starts sending more B.O.W.s out into the city as Plan B. This level is by far the worst level in the entire game. Having to deal with both the Spec Ops and the large amount of Hunters makes this level a huge pain in the ass to play through. And as always, the AI teammates are about as useful as a goddamn pebble. And by this point, along with all the other levels in this game, I realized how terrible the cover system in this game was. You see, in order to take cover in this game, you just have to walk up towards an object and you'll take cover behind it, kinda like an army of two. That sounds fine, but the thing is, You'll sometimes take cover when you don't want to, or the game will refuse to put you in cover, making you exposed longer than you should be. What's even worse is that you can't take cover when reloading. If you're reloading, you'll have to wait till the animation is done before you can enter cover. This issue in particular is incredibly dumb and something that could have been easily fixed. And most of the time, the cover system is spent unused as it's only useful against spec ops and no one else. So yeah. Somehow Slant 6 fucked up a simple cover system mechanic. Why am I not surprised? By the end of the level, you make it to the safe house, but are attacked by not one, but two Mr. X's. And... They aren't that difficult. A lot of their attacks cause you to get knocked down, but they barely hurt you. Which is strange considering how hard hitting those attacks look. All you have to do is keep shooting their heads and refilling your ammo with the unlimited ammo supply box next to the bus, and you'll take them down no problem. You may notice that I'm getting up faster than my partners when I get knocked down. That's because there is a way to get up faster than normal. And the best part? The game doesn't tell you how to do it. In fact, nowhere in the entire fucking game does it tell you how to get up faster. Wanna know how to do it? It's actually really simple. All you have to do is keep mashing X to get up faster. Wanna know how I found out? Slant 6 is Twitter. Yep. The developer's fucking Twitter post told people how to get up faster. Really, Slant 6? Couldn't you just, like, put this kind of tutorial thing in the game, or I don't know, put this tip as a hint during the fucking loading screens? Anyways, after dealing with both of the tyrants, Wolfpack finds out that they've been abandoned. Command? Yeah, fuck you two! It's the answer. Doesn't look like they're answering. They fucking left us. Then at the start of the next mission, they get in contact with Umbrella Command again. Wolfpack is pissed off at Umbrella, but they decide to take orders again and go back into the Umbrella Labs to take out the supposed spies in the facility. Well, that whole abandoned Wolfpack thing was completely pointless, now wasn't it? After dealing with endless zombies yet again, Wolfpack runs into Ada Wong. This segment is really, really annoying if you're playing solo, as you'll have to deal with trip mines, incendiary grenades, and Ada shooting at you. And just like with Leon, you take a shitload of damage from her gunfire. 
Unless you're playing as Vector with his cloak ability, this segment can get frustrating real quick. And after getting close to where Ada is, she runs off. And that's the last time we see her in the single player. Thanks for the 30 second cameo, Ada. Your paycheck is down the hallway to the left. Wolfpack eventually gets to the security room and witnesses Ada and Leon after Mr. X was defeated by them. Again, if you're remotely familiar with Resident Evil 2, you know what happens in that scene already, so I'm not going to explain it here. Unfortunately, Wolfpack cannot disable the self-destruct sequence and is forced to evacuate as well. On the way out, Mr. X makes another visit to Wolfpack, except this time he's mutated since his power limiter was destroyed by the lava. This is another easy fight, as his weak point is obvious as hell. Even the game thinks you're stupid by telling you exactly how to beat him. After knocking him off the elevator twice, the facility gets destroyed and now Wolfpack is assigned with hunting down Leon. We've elevated Leon S. Kennedy to be a priority target. He must not be allowed to escape the city. You better hope there's a way to fix this. And we're finally at the last level, which is amazingly the shortest level in the whole game. You just do the same shit you've been doing through the whole game and then finally catch up to Leon, who is of course accompanied by Claire. Hi there. <laughs> oh, this is great. Claire cheap shots you in this part. The first knockdown is scripted and causes no damage, but she fires a second shot which knocks you down again before you can even move and causes you damage. Say it with me now. So you just take care of the soldiers and zombies as you move closer to Leon's position. This part can end up being the worst part of the game if you don't know what to do. What you have to do is wait for the wooden gate to blow up, then cause some Spec Ops soldiers to bleed in order to attract the large Crimson Head Horde. Problem is, if you end up bleeding, you'll basically get swarmed and murdered in a matter of seconds. If done correctly, all you have to do is run to the ladder and you win. Then again, this part is easier if you're playing as Vector, as you can just cloak by everyone and get to the ladder once the fence blows up. Calling it now, Vector was created to be the only speedrun character of the game. So, once you head up the ladder, no way, I mean climb in place on the ladder, you corner Leon. Oh god, there's his face again. <laughs> Wait a second, what did they do to Claire and Sherry's faces? Oh god, <laughs> Oh god, just- Oh god! At this point in the game, you are given a big choice. You can either protect Leon, or kill Leon. Why are you doing this? For Umbrella? Money? <coughs> What's in it for you, huh? Hang on. I need to mention something. This part was Raccoon City's biggest selling point. The ability to change the canon of the Resident Evil series. But you know what the dumbest part is? This is the only time in the entire fucking game where you could do something like this! Throughout the whole damn game, you barely change anything related to how the main games went. And this is the only event when you can alter the story. There could have been so many opportunities to alter the timeline in this game, such as killing Nikolai in the third level instead of letting him get away, or have Nemesis never get the virus to make him go after the Stars members. There were so many opportunities to add to the what if concept of this game, but all it boils down to in the end is choosing whether to kill Leon or not. What a fucking waste of a concept. So, I decided to pick the choice of killing Leon, just to see what would happen, and... Wait, where the hell are we? Random change of scenery much? That's a little abrupt if you ask me, Slant6. So, the last part of the game involves fighting two of your comrades to see which side will win. Oh wow, this twist is something I've never seen done in a game before. It's so original and clever. Wait a minute. Splinter Cell Conviction already did this! For those who don't know, at the end of Conviction's co-op mode, Archer is given a message to kill Kestrel, except Kestrel finds out about this order. This then boils down to a duel between both players where only one can survive. That was a cool twist. But in this game, it just feels abrupt and makes me think that Wolfpack planned out where they wanted to fight each other like if they were playing paintball or something. Alright, here's the teams. Tony Yayo, Lloyd Banks, you're gonna be attacking. Bitch took my skull. Blue Kid, you beat Defending Master Chief. Whoever wins gets the title of the best ending. Alright, ready? Let's get it on! Another problem with this segment is that it is relatively unbalanced, as it is in 2 versus 2. 
It's actually three versus two. If you decide to protect Leon, you have to kill the two attackers to win. If you're attacking Leon, you have to kill the two defenders and kill Leon as well. The big problem with this is that Leon takes forever to kill! Seriously, he's a bigger bullet sponge than four hunters combined! What's even worse is that his bullets still cause a shit ton of damage, making killing Leon more annoying than it should be. It doesn't help that your AI teammate refuses to help out with killing Leon, having you, once again, do everything yourself. So after finally killing Leon, we get to the end of the game. Command, the cop is dead. Good, now finish your mission and bring us the girl. Copy that. You're coming with us. Claire, I don't wanna go. Sorry, we've got orders. Yep, that's it. For being a canon changing ending, that really sucked. So, what about the other ending? Well, if you decide to defend Leon and win, you instead get this. We're not negotiating with you. Finish your mission. Finish it yourself. Consider our contract with Umbrella terminated. Then you can die along with Raccoon City. We'll take our chances. Why didn't you kill us? You aren't the leverage we thought you were. Umbrella's turned on us already. It's time we stab them in the back. What about Sherry? Keep her. We've got other plans. Once we get out of this city, we're going to gut Umbrella from the inside out. That's right. Sequel bait. Fuck you, Slant 6. Fuck you. Fuck you, and fuck you! Well, that does it for single player. What else do I have to say? This entire concept and alternate story could have been really cool, but it instead feels lazy and full of missed opportunities, especially when it came with the promise of changing the Resident Evil storyline. I mean, you can change it, but it feels unsatisfying and could have gone so much further. Overall, the entire what-if plot of Operation Raccoon City ends up falling flat on its face with relatively uninteresting new characters and poor execution of the story. Since I had nowhere else to talk about this, I guess I should talk about the graphics and sound design now. Personally, I think the graphics in Operation Raccoon City are actually pretty decent. With the exception of some character models- oh, oh god, please! Go away! The Wolfpack team and all the enemies all look good, and the B.O.W.s stay true to the original designs, which is always nice. Textures and special effects such as explosions and fire look decent as well, but I noticed that most of Raccoon City itself loves to be the color blue for some reason. Overall, I think this game does sport some pretty decent graphics. It may not be up to par with, say, Resident Evil 5's graphic quality, but it still holds its own in a way. As for sound design, it ends up both being a hit and a miss. The voice acting is well done, for Resident Evil standards anyway, and some of the in-game music is actually pretty good. On the flip side, a lot of the guns sound like they barely pack a punch and sound like damn airsoft guns, and some of the other music in the game sounds like awful dubstep. Now, throughout this whole review, I've been explaining certain game mechanics and how I felt about them. So now I'll just wrap up my experiences with the gameplay here. Overall, I felt the gameplay sucked balls. All it really is is a poor man's SOCOM with Resident Evil slapped onto it. And considering Slant 6 developed a poor man's SOCOM before this, it's honestly not too surprising. However, there are things I liked about this game. I liked how the health system stayed true to Resident Evil, meaning that there is no regenerating health in sight. That means you can pick up the traditional green herbs line around to restore your health if you have no first aid spray. Smoke weed every day. The handling of the experience system and how you buy weapons was also a nice change of pace, and the weapon variety is pretty decent as well. I also really liked how each character had different abilities to choose from, making it interesting to see what each character could do. 
And finally, as with most co-op games, playing with actual human players is obviously the preferred method of playing the story, and makes playing the single player slightly better. That's all I really liked about the gameplay. Now, here's what I hated. The shooting feels off and doesn't feel satisfying at all, the cover system and melee combat both have a share of annoying issues, the AI for both the teammates and enemies are terrible and are unnecessarily hard to kill on the normal difficulty, and even if you play with human friends to get rid of the teammate AI issue, I just didn't have much fun with this game. But you want to know what I did find fun about the game? The glitches. Holy fuck the glitches. I already showed a few, but since I encountered so many, I decided to go ahead and make a huge montage for you guys to watch. Enjoy the train wreck. <laughs> Backup single player DLC? You sure? Okay, fine. I need to address something when it comes to DLC for this review series. For this series, I'm not going to be covering DLC releases for a game rental I review, as paying for additional content for something you're renting doesn't make much sense. However, if said DLC is free instead of costing money, then I am able to cover it. The first DLC for this game is free, so I'm going to briefly cover it. The thing is, it's only one single player mission. There are other missions, but those cost money, so I'm not covering those. So, let's dive right back into the single player and cover the first Spec Ops DLC. Instead of playing as the Wolfpack team, you instead play as the Spec Ops, of course, and you can choose from six characters again, such as the lone black Jamaican Shayona, DA, the team leader with a really dumb name, and... Party girl? 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 This mission is basically the team's first encounter with the viral outbreak as they fight through zombies and umbrella soldiers. Gameplay wise, it's the same crap that the main game had, so there really isn't much to add in terms of those aspects. After setting off some signal flares to signal back up, you eventually run into Jill Valentine, who is being chased by Nemesis. Run! Stars. Although this part says that Jill dying results in a mission failure, it's actually easy to not have her die, as saving her involves shooting Nemesis a couple of times before you and Jill can just run away from him. Shortly after escaping from Nemesis- Oh god, Jill, not you too! Oh Jesus, oh god. Oh, I can't do it. I'm out of barf bucket. Anyways, Jill separates from the spec up so she can work on her own, and the last leg of the mission basically boils down to fighting Nemesis until you win. Just like when you faced him in the Umbrella missions, Nemesis can take a lot of damage before going down, but here, he is a lot more annoying to fight. After finally defeating Nemesis, the mission ends. That's all there is to this DLC mission. Like I said, this is the only one I'm going to cover for this game since this mission was free. Obviously, the other missions continue from where this one leaves off, but the DLC still has the fundamental issues of the main game, meaning that while it may be new content, it still lacks the fun. But we're still not done. There's just one aspect I still need to talk about. The multiplayer. To put it short, I do not like the multiplayer in this game. I feel that most of the time it can be really unbalanced and cheap, but it still had some good ideas under the hood. 
There are a total of four modes in this game, along with a decent amount of maps based on locations in Raccoon City. Team Attack is really just Team Deathmatch between Umbrella and Spec Ops. It's fairly standard, so I don't really have much to say about it really, other than kill or be killed. Biohazard is sort of like a capture the flag game type where you have to grab G-Virus samples and take them to your base. This can be a fun mode, but it can sometimes be really easy to camp the enemy base and kill the person carrying the sample as he closes in on his base. Aside from that, it's just a different version of capture the- Did I just grab the sample through the fucking wall? I grabbed the sample through the wall. <laughs> what do you know? Nope! Fuck it! Next mode! Survivor is easily my favorite mode in the game. All you have to do is kill anything and everything until the evac chopper arrives. Then you have to get to extraction in order to win. The thing is, only four of the eight people can get extracted, meaning that things can get hectic when the chopper lands. It's a really fun mode, and it's probably the only mode I would ever consider playing again in this game. Then, there's Heroes mode. Oh, oh god. Heroes mode. This mode is a goddamn disaster. This mode pits four heroes and four villains against each other. The heroes include Leon, Claire, Jill, and... Carlos. CARLOS! The villains, on the other hand, have Hunk, Ada, Nikolai, and Lone Wolf. Wait, who the fuck is Lone Wolf? Yep. Slant6 couldn't think of a fourth villain, so they just made one up exclusively for this mode. Now, I heard that Lone Wolf was actually the chopper pilot that saved Hunk during the fourth survivor mission. But as far as I'm concerned, he's just a fanfic character to fill up the villain slot. The goal of this mode is to eliminate all the heroes on one team in order to win. If you die as a hero, you will respawn as a regular Spec Ops or Umbrella character. The heroes all have high amounts of health and can take quite a beating and it can be amusing to hunt down Carlos at times. However, the reason I hate this mode the most is that the worst of the gameplay rears his ugly head here. Remember way back in the review when I said meleeing can cause stun locking? Well, prepare to see a bunch of stun locking in this mode. Seriously, you can just endlessly wail on opponents and give them no chance to fight back. It's even worse when you can easily knock people over by sprint meleeing into them, over and over again. This can cause battles to be extremely one-sided and flat-out broken. These practices do rear their head in the other modes, but in Heroes mode it is the absolute worst, and makes the game even less fun to play than it already is. So in short, Heroes mode is awful and only benefits from being a cameo fest. Across all the modes, however, zombies and other BOWs enter the fight to make the multiplayer a little more hectic and I actually like that. If this stuff wasn't included in the multiplayer, it would have ended up just being boring 4 vs 4 battles. But overall, I thought the multiplayer failed to hold its own, despite survivor mode being really fun and having the addition of AI zombies and monsters making matches more interesting. So is Operation Raccoon City worth a rental? No. No it's not. This game may be the worst Resident Evil game I have played, as it basically fails to capture the spirit or resemble anything remotely like Resident Evil. Even if the Resident Evil brand was taken out of this game, all that's left is a generic third-person shooter with faulty mechanics. I know that this was trying to be an experiment with how Resident Evil would handle as a third-person shooter, but if you ask me, it ended up being a huge failure of an experiment. If you want a better Resident Evil title this year, Please play Revelations instead, or just cross your fingers and hope Resident Evil 6 delivers the goods. I know this may seem a little abrupt, especially near the end of the review, but if I didn't mention this now, it probably would come to bite me in the ass after I upload this, but... While I was editing the review and everything, I already recorded my footage and script and was just working on it. In the middle of that, I read up that a Raccoon City patch actually came out and addressed a couple of bugs. They improved matchmaking, which honestly when I played the multiplayer I didn't have much trouble with. They improved the enemy and ally AI, which I bitched about. They adjusted weapon tweaks, they improved the aiming, they added items that could be picked up while dashing, so when you're running you just pick up shit like nothing. The infinite CQC that was 
abundant in multiplayer is apparently gone now. Players can take cover while performing the dive and just a bunch of other bugs. Usually I would give developers credit for this, but here's the problem. They decided to release this patch after their $36 worth of DLC was released first. They only cared about money before actually fixing the game first. So, yeah, it's fixed, and unfortunately, I already returned the game way before this patch came out, so I can't address the patches properly by showing you how they fixed it. But, honestly, this patch doesn't fix what I feel about the game. The game is still fucking terrible. It's just, like, sure, the patch fixes stuff, but it's too late for me to fucking care. So, there you go. If you're still interested for some reason, there's a patch that fixes some of this, but honestly, I still think the game sucks, even though they fixed issues. But there's still problems with the game that this patch did not address. So, there you have it. I hope you guys enjoy this new idea, because it finally gives me motivation to do reviews again. OW! What the hell? <sighs> Damn it, Yale, why did you do that? Oh, oh god. Oh. See, blue. Shit, I must be infected. Hang on, where did I put that antiviral spray? Oh. Here it is. Don't worry, let me take care of it. Wait, Barry, no! There we go. Oh my god. His face blew right off. Oh well, that'll be fixed easily. Oh, what the? That? I'm alive! Huh. Well, thanks, Barry. You didn't have to shoot me, though. I mean, I had antiviral spray and all. Oh well. Reviving is better, anyway. Yeah, maybe you're right. By the way, how did you know I was infected? Oh, I saw that infection symbol next to your name from downstairs. Name? What name? Oh, really? We're gonna go this route now? Hey, you're the one that writes the reviews, not me. By the way, what game were you covering? Operation Raccoon City. What? <laughs> we don't acknowledge that game's existence around here. Hmm? Ooh. Revelations? I guess I could borrow this while he's dead and all. Oh, don't worry, he'll be fine. Punch to the head anyway. <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't show you how baller that was in the game has sense. <laughs>